Uh, welcome everybody to the um, County Collaborative Call um, for the PA Care Partnership. Today's call is uh, going to be on the trauma-informed community that is um, and it's going to be hosted by uh, Joe Barnhart and his team out of Crawford County. Again, my name is Mark Durgan. I'm the uh, Project Director for the Pennsylvania Care Partnership. Um, just in the form of um, a little bit of maintenance. So if you are um, on the call, we have not muted all the lines. We wanted to keep that open for any kind of questions that we have. Um, it's uh, as part of an aspect of the meeting. So if you are on your end, you can mute your line by uh, using the Zoom um, web app feature and uh, using uh, the little mute button in the lower left-hand corner, or if you are on your call, you're on your phone only, um, you can use the mute button on your phone, or I believe it's also hitting star six. Um, so with that, welcome. This is, this is our part of our regular series that we have on the uh, fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, so with that, I will pass this over to Joe Barnhart from Crawford County, one of our system of care counties under the PA Care Partnership. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Joe Barnhart. I'm our system of care manager in Crawford County, Pennsylvania. Uh, just by a little bit of context, our system of care is a um, collaborative, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a collaborative of uh, leadership of the child serving system, uh, community organizations, um, and the family and uh, family and uh, youth service uh, partners. Um, in a nutshell, our, our job is to break down silos uh, by promoting integration of services and coordination of, of services on a variety of fronts impacting children and youth. So what we're sharing is uh, a piece of what we do, which is a, a lot of work on trauma. Uh, we've been very fortunate with uh, grants and other resources to be able to uh, get into uh, the subject and and hopefully have an impact here in our county. We don't uh, pretend to have all the answers, but we do have some experience on what has worked for us. Uh, uh, technology hasn't been kind to us today, so we'll we'll uh, be working through that. But um, uh, you, know, you know, we've had our ups and downs, and and hopefully we can share some things that'll be useful to you in your journey. So our people on board with us today is uh, Bruce Harlan. He is the Executive Director of Women's Services here in uh, Meadville. That's a, a women's shelter and uh, uh, for abuse and homelessness. Uh, Audrey Smith is the owner and uh, a professional therapist through Parkside Psychological Associates. Sabrina Hornstein is a family partner with us. Uh, she also works part-time with our, our system of care and myself as the, uh, the manager. So where's Crawford? We're in uh, Northwestern Pennsylvania, highlighted there on the slide, just to give a little context of where we are with the rest of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, some of our wonderful pictures of the county, uh, we're rural. Uh, that picture in the top middle is CARP, which is, if you're from anywhere over in this area, you would be familiar with uh, Pima Tuming Lake and the, the CARP that gather there to be fed. Uh, so basically we're um, a county that's uh, pretty rural, uh, relatively small population, uh, spread out over a thousand square miles. We have high rate of poverty, our biggest metropolitan center is about 13,000 people, pretty much a white county. Um, not a whole lot of interstate travel through here, but we do have one main interstate. Some interesting and concerning stats with our Pennsylvania Youth Survey. Uh, if you're from Pennsylvania, you're probably familiar with it, but it is a um, survey conducted here every two years of students, in different grades. We have some highlights uh, that are of concern, and that is the 21% of students who have considered suicide and the high rate of, of students who think life isn't worth it. What you're seeing now is a family snapshot, and that is Sabrina, uh, who's our family partner. 
Uh, and that's her and one of her children and husband, where she received an award for uh, as an outstanding uh, parent uh, at a recent uh, behavioral health conference last uh, last fall. And I asked Sabrina to share a little bit of her story to kind of set the context of why we think uh, this work is pretty important to us and on a on a system level, uh, but more importantly, how it's impacting or uh, can impact families. And Sabrina is at a, a training today as a family support uh, peer specialist, and she is on the phone. I think she's all set to go. You you ready to go, Sabrina? Yes, I am. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sabrina Manstein, as Joe said. Um, I have a son who I adopted out of foster care out of Erie County, actually, um, in 2000 and Hi, I believe is when I adopted him. Um, I have been through multiple family systems after his adoption, starting at age four. Um, many of the child serving systems, I have been through eight inpatient stays and four RTFs, two, uh, three secure placements. I've, my son has been expelled from two different partial hospitalization programs. And he's been to a stabilization placement and was kind of failed out of that. Um, my story kind of goes like this. We were starting last summer. We were at a looking at a secure state placement for him because his behaviors were so violent and aggressive that he could not be placed anywhere else in the mental health system or in a just a an RTF at this point he was it was pretty pretty a bad situation I guess you could say um, while he was in a secure placement we were waiting and waiting to see where they were going to find that would take him before we got to the actual decision that a state placement probably wasn't the best place but it was the only one we had available um, I had to deal with JPO. Um, they were the first trauma-informed agency that I had worked with. Um, that opened up a whole new world for my family and I. Um, they were the first professional team that we worked with that was um, very well trained with trauma. Um, they were the only professional that had worked with my son that did not cause any kind of um, escalations with him and were not assaulted. Um, JPO willingly was taking my son from the lockdown secure state facility or state lockup to therapy twice a week because they did not believe he belonged locked up. They believed that this was a mental health issue and they were trying to keep him in the mental health system. Um, through JPO and the therapy, um, our family actually was showing improvement, and so was my son's behaviors. Even though he was in a lockup facility, he wasn't progressive anymore, and that was shocking because between the ages of four and 13, there was not a month, a week, or three days straight that there was not some kind of aggression. Um, when he was in the lockup facility, there was four months straight where there was no aggression, and it was very, it was looking good to me. Um, the court was very, very hesitant on letting him go home from a secure lock facility. But with JPO saying that we want to give this family another chance and that the mental health facilities had failed for my son and myself that they wanted to give it a chance. Um, so my son is still home. That was in September. He's still home currently. And it's been six months that he's been home. Um, in February, we had another uh, incident. He started to, to escalate. He wasn't physically aggressive. He hadn't hit anybody, but he was starting to push and become physical. So we did an inpatient stay at Southwood Hospital in Pittsburgh. They were not trauma trained. Um, Neither was the hospital that we had him admitted from, which was in Mezo. Um, during the evaluation to see where he was going to go and what they wanted to do with him, he was threatened to stick a tube down his throat and put him in a coma, that if he didn't sit down, um, 
that was their plan. They also had the police there, which the police would grab him and slam him on the bed if he did not sit still. Um, mind you, we had been there for 12 hours. Um, there's been like a huge difference. We know who's trauma trained. We know who's not trauma trained. When we come into the, the different scenarios, we know right off the bat. Um, because of the trauma training, our house is very stable compared to the places that aren't trauma informed and trained. And I would like to see it go further. And it, and it has made a huge improvement in our lives. And I, I would really, really, really like the rest of the community to get on board with this. And Joe. Well, thanks, Sabrina. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the ground level experience that Sabrina shared. Uh, we have some feedback. If, if your phone's not on mute, you may want to try that. Um, but um, Sabrina's uh, certainly helped keep us and our movement uh, as one of you know, a number of family members who have experienced dealing with a, a child saving system on a personal basis. And uh, that insight is critical to our understanding of things that we want to pursue as an organization and uh, trauma informed movement in the county. Um, so some of the things that we've identified up front uh, as areas that we want to address is to approach this subject as a public health issue. Um, uh, for those that are uh, familiar at all with uh, the trauma movement, that's that's pretty common, and it makes a lot of sense. It's simply uh, it's everything from universal precautions to specialized treatments. Uh, we know that in our county, we want to build capacity to, to prevent and treat trauma. We want to increase access to services, and we want to make sure services are integrated. So. That has been kind of the overarching goal as, as we have proceeded over the years. Um, it took us a while kind of to formulate some of those items, but um, we were able to get them where, to the point where we're working on at different stages a lot of these uh, items. So the, our history is uh, goes back to about 2011. Because before that, I don't. You know, others may have been talking about trauma, but uh, we were not. Um, our uh, our knowledge of trauma was limited, and uh, our first experience uh, was a conference that came about simply as a result of uh, stumbling upon a news article where Dr. Hodes from Pennsylvania was talking about trauma and its effect on child development. And we uh, decided to go further with that. It just made sense to us. It resonated at a human service agency. So we uh, brought together uh, uh, some service providers, uh, had a lot of people show up, lots of good things happening. People were excited uh, to the point they were fired up. I, for many of you who certainly heard about trauma or you probably wouldn't be with us today, uh, it's a subject that makes a lot of sense to explain behaviors that goes beyond just dealing with symptoms. And that's what happened at our conference. People really got, got engaged. They were talking. Uh, it was you know, pretty inspirational to bring that many together. It's not something we typically did. Uh, but what happened? And it's nothing happened. Um, all that energy didn't go anywhere. Um, and, Looking back, some of the reasons why that didn't happen in 2011, although we opened our, um, our conference to anyone, uh, it was pretty much a system-driven event. The people who participated were uh, agency personnel, uh, therapists, uh, technicians. Um, human services um, drove that conference. Uh, we did not really seek out family and youth stakeholders. Uh, Sabrina and her family weren't there for sure. Um, and one agency driving the subject after the conference was not enough. We, um, we all have our jobs to do and trying to uh, develop a, uh, 
a system-wide change in how you do business is more than a one agency job. I and mean, there was no, no structure to move forward. A couple years later, some things happened uh, that, that caused us to come back to the subject in a, a more thoughtful way. Uh, one of the things was we had begun participating in the system of care initiative that's been going on throughout the country. Uh, we were fortunate to get some, some grant dollars to start a system of care, develop the county leadership team, uh, and began meeting regularly and connected with uh, Audrey Smith and Harry Nelson, uh, who became our uh, trauma uh, champions. They were kind of parallel to us, working through uh, in their own practice, uh, developing their, their own expertise in this field. And we came together both uh, as a system and as practitioners to invite uh, SAMHSA back to uh, provide, assist us with a conference. Uh, and again, we introduced uh, the ACE study, uh, you know, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, um, talked about different types of trauma, introduced that to the community uh, at a, a fairly large event. Leading up to that conference, we had um, numerous public presentations where Audrey and her brother would uh, uh, present overviews of what trauma was about so that we could bring in and encourage um, a wide variety of participants. One of the, the things that Audrey um, brought to our county was uh, her experience with Peace for Tarpon. And I think, Audrey, you're available on the audio. I am. Could you talk a bit about your experience with Peace for Tarpon and how that fit in with, with our movement? <laughs> Yes, we, um, I happened to be online one day and I was looking at um, uh, treatment, um, uh, behavioral health treatment for uh, trauma because we've been treating trauma for, um, since 1994, um, particularly around sexual abuse victims. And so I was looking at what was new in the, in the treatment field and I stumbled onto um, something called trauma-informed community and I'd never heard of that before. And it talked about um, Tarpon Springs, Florida, being hailed as the uh, first trauma-informed community in the United States. And if you've been around uh, the Meadville Erie area in February, you know what it's like up there. And it's, um, it's a place you want to get out of. So um, it seems like a great time to go to Tarpon Springs. And um, so we contacted the people in, um, who were heading up Peace for Tarpon and ask if we could come and visit. And so my brother and I came down and, and um, they welcomed us with open arms and um, they had been um, working on trauma-informed community um, at that point since 2005. So um, we really spent some time with them. In fact, we kept making multiple trips back because Tarpon Springs is also a beautiful place on the, um, the Gulf of Mexico. And um, they, were, they were just, they acted as great mentors to us. Um, one of the things that we wanted was for them to tell us exactly how to do it. You know, what is the step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process? And they really said, you know, we can't give you that because you're going to need to kind of figure that out on your own. And at that point, there weren't a lot of models out there in order uh, to turn to. Um, but they really did point us in the right direction and, and talk to us about um, some of the barriers and some of the challenges that we were probably going to face and gave us um, just their experience of how they had navigated those. And, um, and then also just helped us uh, think about what kind of structure uh, we wanted to have in order to move forward. Um, so we came back and talked to the county about um, uh, joining with Peace for Tarpon and um, becoming Peace for Crawford. And uh, Tarpon Springs was, was all on board with that. And um, I don't know how many Peace for communities there are now, but there are many. Uh, mostly throughout Florida, but also I believe there are some in New Jersey and I believe there's some in Texas. So um, that's how we became a Peace Force community. Some of the things that uh, came out of our conference, which ended up being a, a two-day event, uh, the first day was about the launch of our system of care initiative. And the second day was 
a, the launch of uh, our trauma-informed or Peace for Crawford movement. Um, again, we had, similar to our first experience, uh, lots of good presenters, motivating uh, and inspiring information. Um, people were all fired up. This sounded rather familiar. Uh, but something did happen. And the, um, those somethings were we started taking some action. We had a structure. Uh, in our case, it was a system of care type of structure, which gave us a collaborative organization to shepherd our, our initial approaches. It was the, uh, the first time in talking to our system of care leadership team when, when you talked about forming committee to do a job, uh, instead of people looking the other way, uh, hands went up uh, volunteering. And almost everyone on that, uh, I think we had around 16 or 17 members of our leadership team at that point, uh, from school superintendents to uh, agency directors and uh, uh, in community organizations as well as family and youth, uh, you, know, you looked around the table, everybody wanted to be on this. And I think the reason for that was no matter what your organization or uh, whether you're just uh, there because you have a child who's in need of services, uh, everybody could relate in some respect or another to the, the subject of trauma and its impact either on their family like Sabrina's or on their agency or their school district. So it was an easy sell. Uh, it launched in 2013-14. Uh, agencies uh, uh, came forward looking for training. We, uh, we trained about 600 people <clears throat> from uh, child welfare through drug and alcohol, juvenile probation, uh, got uh, some of the schools involved early on and uh, some of those trainings were just overviews. Some of those were more specialized to uh, give the how-tos of how to work in a, uh, with a trauma-informed lens in your organization. We had some com community coalitions. The, the pictures you're seeing are just some of the, the groups that came together. And the, the top uh, uh, in the center is Wendy Ellis who you may know or have heard of as uh, the developer of the Building Community uh, Resilience Model, which uh, identifies not only adverse childhood experiences, but adverse community experiences, that environments that impact uh, uh, those experiences. Um, uh, the others are kind of what you probably see in your own groups. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, we've got uh, the director of drug and alcohol, uh, juvenile probation, a county commissioner, uh, school district superintendent, all, all of whom, uh, I don't know about your experience, but mine has been getting some of those folks to come to yet another meeting. It was usually a challenge. Uh, they readily came uh, for an all day meeting and have continued to be supportive of us over the years. Uh, it also led to the uh, trying to work with different groups and organizations to uh, bring in family and youth members and provide resilient services. Some of the um, big initiatives that came out of that conference was we were fortunate enough to receive a grant from the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and uh, Delinquency, and that enabled us to work with several agencies and develop uh, trauma-informed organization approach. And Audrey, again, I, if you would kind of explain what we did with that grant and how it impacted us. Yes, this is a PCCD grant um, for, um, it was a uh, two-year grant um, that allowed us to um, work with four agencies. It was Human Services, which is our Children and Youth Services and Intellectual Disabilities and Mental Health, um, Drug and Alcohol, juvenile probation and women's services, and then also two schools. And so we, um, we were able to work with Meadville Middle School and um, Titusville High School. So we had six entities all together. And the whole idea was the, um, um, helping these entities um, begin to understand what is a trauma-informed organization 
and um, to begin to take those steps toward becoming a trauma or becoming more trauma informed as a as an agency or as an entity. Um, it was it was a it was a really interesting experience um, um, because they were such diverse um, groups. Um, it made it really challenging in that respect. Um, but it was really fascinating to see um, uh, what each uh, organization did. Um, they each had their kind of their own path. Um, uh, basically, what we had them do was some basic trauma training, and then um, they each did a self-assessment to look at um, where they were in um, the um, trauma-informed and being trauma-informed. And so the assessments involved all levels of staff. So everyone from the top to the bottom uh, was involved in the assessment and, and also a percentage of consumers. So we were always shooting for at least 30% of the consumers um, being involved in that self-assessment. Then we helped them analyze, analyze their data and then set goals for um, what they wanted to change, what they wanted to hold on to and continue to do and what was going well and what they wanted to do differently. Um, and some just really interesting things came out of that. Things like, um, just to, to name a few highlights, our juvenile probation um, really um, incorporated um, trauma-informed um, thinking into their hiring processes, um, into their interview processes. Um, also, um, um, let's see, drug and alcohol uh, rewrote their manual that they give to clients, um, consumers when they when they come. And trauma, is, it talks about trauma from the very beginning of that manual. Um, other people made changes in um, organizational procedures, <laughs> the, way things, the way things work. I always give the example of um, a client that um, had said to me, she was in her late 70s, and she said she had gone to um, a mental health organization and had um, was doing the intake. And for the first time ever, she mentioned that she had been raped. Um, and she said she'd never, ever, ever told anyone, not her husband of 50 some years, not anyone. So she said she'd been raped and that um, the intake worker just went on to the next question. And so that was kind of our goal was just to have each entity look at their procedures and their processes and be able to think about how we may be inadvertently um, re-traumatizing the very people that we are trying to help and um, how we can do that differently. So there were some really exciting outcomes from that. Um, and I, I hope um, those are continuing to happen. Thanks. Uh, we have continued you know, part of that grant was to the PCCD grant was to be able to replicate what was done in those organizations. And although we haven't uh, been able to expand it as quickly or as broadly as we would have liked, uh, we have uh, since that initial effort with the self assessments and organizational trauma sensitivity, uh, been able to work with two elementary schools. Um, to took very two different very different approaches to how they were going to be uh, trauma sensitive. Uh, the one actually uh, developed a lot of uh, uh, activities that they could do in classrooms, uh, from uh, busy bars where uh, students could swing their feet their feet on uh, bars that uh, were under their desks that were easily installed. Uh, having uh, you know, the ability to use standing desks so they could move around. Um, just a whole lot of kind of innovative ideas that the, the school came up with. Uh, the other uh, focused on uh, uh, assessing their, their needs, that they needed someone, a family member, who could go out into the community and kind of bridge uh, between the elementary school and parents uh, to get them into the school for events and for uh, things involving their kids. The um, both processes, I think, uh, worked pretty well. They, we were able to do them relatively inexpensively with human services staff um, and hope to uh, continue to be able to, to replicate that, that process. 
one thing when we really learned, and I, I suppose for many, it's a no brainer. It's a lot easier to work, I think, in elementary schools. Um, uh, the staff, uh, you know, sometimes when you get into high schools, things uh, get a little jaded. Uh, elementary schools, it's, it's hard not to uh, want to do these types of activities. And uh, we, had, we were very well received in the, the two elementary schools that we approached about supporting them and becoming more trauma sensitive. We have made an emphasis on getting uh, youth and family involvement in all, our, all of our initiatives. It's not always easy, um, particularly with youth, but um, we've been fairly successful just by reaching out to those who uh, show any kind of interest in the subject. We support uh, a neighborhood center here in, in Meadville with uh, some additional financial support when we're able, but also with uh, just the resources of our uh, system of care group. So there's been, uh, you know, since 2013, which when we really got started till now, uh, uh, a lot of different uh, accomplishments. Uh, the, you know, we've had these public education trainings, which between conferences that we hold jointly with Erie County uh, over the past five years, uh, uh, which typically are very well attended. They, they fill up within a couple days of registration opening. Uh, we bring in quality speakers and do workshops. So, you know, the, the goal is to, uh, at least part of our efforts is to get out awareness so that we can build on that awareness to uh, further trainings and become more informed and sensitive in our dealings. We have emphasized uh, adult and youth mental health first aid by providing uh, not only trainings, but uh, uh, sending staff from different organizations to um, train the trainer opportunities. Um, We've talked about the school trauma uh, self-assessments. Uh, we've participated with the Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention Program to uh, promote uh, various trainings, including uh, presentations of question, persuade, and refer, uh, a relatively short training uh, for the public on suicide prevention. Not all of these things have been our idea. Uh, it's just what we as a, uh, as a movement either are connected with or we support in whatever way we can uh, or we initiate. Some other highlights, uh, we've recently become involved with the Keystone Crisis Intervention Program and Bruce, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. So we had some local people who were trained and were part of the statewide team, but we were approached by KKIT to see if we would in fact want to have a local team of um, local um, trained providers. Uh, I think this was tried initially in Adams County. Um, I believe we were the second county to develop uh, its own team. And so we had 20 community members from diverse backgrounds come together who attended a five day training, four day training. And uh, we're you know, still in the process of developing this team and figuring out how we're gonna do this, but we can now respond to any situation here locally with our own team members. We also have a um, trauma-informed community development initiative that we just begun. This is based off of some programming that was done in Pittsburgh. I think it's called Focus Pittsburgh. Yes. Uh, Reverend Abernathy uh, started this program in the Pittsburgh, I think it was in the Hill section. Um, and it's a way of identifying trauma champions within micro communities and um, working with them to develop uh, their strengths and um, acknowledging their own resources and building on those resources to build uh, stronger communities, build those connections within those communities. Uh, we just started that project, but it's rather exciting. Um, Audrey's going to talk a little bit about our Peace for Crawford strategic plan, which took us a couple of years to pull together. But Audrey, you want to say more about that? <laughs> Just that it did take a couple of years to pull together. Two years, two grueling years. Um, uh, we did, um, there were 
I believe five of us, and um, we had also hired a consultant to lead us through that process. And I think that was that was really really helpful for us. Um, it probably would have taken longer than two years if we would have tried to do it without the, the help of the consultant. Um, what we ended up coming up with was um, basically uh, four areas. This is awareness, and that has to do with just helping um, people really begin to understand what trauma is and how it impacts people's lives. Um, we also wanted to work uh, the step beyond awareness so that people um, actually then can think about, well, what do I do? Um, what do I do differently? How do I respond to this in a way that, that um, can have, help people to have better outcomes? Um, um, the, you know, we talk about the trauma lens, being able to really begin to see through a trauma lens and, um, and then developing strategies. So the trains um, are, are um, really taking people to the next step of action. Um, screening, assessment, and intervention. We really wanted to uh, make sure that we have that in our community so that um, there's more of a universal screening um, occurring. Um, several of the entities that I mentioned before have implemented screening, and so we do have screening happening, but we'd like to see more screening, and so um, working toward uh, screening um, really good assessment so that people have um, are referred for good assessment and making sure that there's a, that when we do identify people that have need that we have um, the resources available for them to receive really good intervention. And so um, some of that being behavioral health, um, one of the things that we found in our community was so many of the kids um, that really could benefit from, from treatment um, don't have the ability to get to treatment. Um, so because we are so rural, um, one of the things that we uh, did was to get a grant to um, go into the, to put um, therapists, trauma trained therapists into the school. And I think we are in eight or nine school buildings now um, throughout the, the community, the, the county. And um, so many of those kids, I think, that we're treating just, they would never set foot in the office, you know, the office door. The parents don't have the money to get them there. They don't have the transportation. Um, they don't have the time. They're working. Um, and so by taking this step to the school, I think we've been able to really um, that's been really helpful, but we, we still there's still expansion that needs to occur. So, um, being able to to continue to develop good um, treatment and also some of the alternative treatment, um, um, teaming up with some of the trauma sensitive yoga, some some alternative therapies too. Um, and finally, um, also advocacy, um, uh, prevention and advocacy is our fourth area of focus. Um, um, really looking at what can we do to prevent trauma, particularly childhood adversity. Um, how do we, how do we, um, how can we impact that? And how can we advocate for people who have experienced trauma? So those are our four areas of our strategic plan and that's gonna kind of give us structure as we move forward. So part and parcel with these efforts, we wanted to do some data mapping. Uh, of course, we're all familiar with ACEs and the impact that trauma has on individuals, but we also know that trauma plays a role in communities and neighborhoods, that there's historical trauma and, and structural trauma. And we wanted to take a closer look at where some of these um, neighborhoods are that are challenged by a lot of traumas. And so working with our local college, Allegheny College, and students who are well-versed in GIS, we began collecting data. We collected 911 data, police calls, um, domestic violence incidences, um, where there were opioid uh, and um, drug overdoses and, and drug deaths. And we started, and we were looking at public health data that's available. Uh, and we started layering this on, and we could drill down to the street level in, in most of our communities, not all of our communities, and really get a sense of what uh, neighborhoods were struggling, maybe perhaps more than others. Now we're able to target some of our resources uh, in some of these neighborhoods. The um, ACES training of volunteers, um, as Audrey mentioned, in part of our strategic plan is awareness. And so we've trained up a small army of community volunteers who can do a 
30 minute, 90 minute or two hour presentation on ACEs. Um, and they are fanning out across the county and continuing this process of making more and more people aware of uh, what ACEs are and how trauma impacts all of us. And then really the last thing was, uh, and this was really quite instrumental in allowing us to move forward with this project is we, we hired a coordinator and a number of us are sharing the cost of that coordinator. Um, and so we've got boots on the ground. We have somebody who can take uh, directions and marching orders from a number of us and get out there and actually do the work. Because as you all know, one of the struggles is we all have day jobs that we're responsible for and being able to do some of this trauma work um, really requires having someone who can be dedicated to that process. One of the things that uh, we have seen happen is uh, a lot of community engagement. And again, it isn't necessarily a Peace for Crawford or a trauma initiative. But there have been a lot of uh, activities that have uh, sprouted along with this process. So although we may not be able to claim full credit, we're happy to take some of the credit as being part of the, the catalyst for a, a lot of activities. And, I think, Bruce, you can summarize those for us. Yeah, go to the next slide. Oh, so, yeah, this has really been one of the more exciting pieces because much of what we've talked about up to this point has been directed by or um, actively engaged by us. But because people are learning about this and because people are being um, or hearing the message that the way you build resilience is to, you know, reduce stressors in people's lives, families' lives, to um, – build up their core competencies and of course build those connections um, they've kind of taken it upon themselves to find ways to do just that and so we have what we call thankful thursdays a group of people figured out that they can go on facebook and say hey a group of us are going to be meeting down at our public square and we're going to pick up litter this afternoon join us and so people just naturally show up and do that uh, people have started developing all of these various social gatherings uh, one of my favorites is the summer music concert series. Um, people who can pick up a guitar and sing, uh, get together at our gazebo in our public square and put on a little concert. People bring their lawn chairs down and uh, enjoy the music. Uh, Pumpkin Fest, Winter Fest. These are just things that people um, started doing on their own with, really any, with very little direction from above. Uh, you may not know this, but Meanville is the home of the zipper. I believe it was invented here. We certainly manufactured the zipper for many, many years. Uh, so we, uh, local artists, started using woodcut blocks to reproduce a zipper. The goal being that um, everybody in the community at some point will have an opportunity to design or create or contribute to a woodcut block. And then it's put together and uh, we're hoping to have to set the world Guinness record for the longest woodcut block project in the world. <laughs> um, it, it already stretches down the street pretty far and, and they can be broken up into smaller pieces and they're, they're hung in a lot of our downtown businesses and merchant shops. Again, it's, it's a way of building connections. A group got together around food. They were interested in uh, doing something about food deserts and creating more food security for people. So they started this organization called Food for Thought, which is really about tying nutrition to performance and social activism. And as an offshoot of that, um, they developed Film for Thought. So it's a monthly documentary that's shown in one of our local neighborhood um, theaters. There's a brown bun box dinner, uh, brown bag dinner given out to people. Um, they're invited to come and enjoy the documentary and stick around afterwards to have a discussion. Again, it's just another way to build connections between people. Um, time banking, some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, this is an interesting concept. So if, I'm, um, if I enjoy mowing lawn and somebody needs their lawn mowed, I agree to go over and mow their lawn. I've just now banked an hour, which then I can cash in because maybe I need someone to make me a spaghetti dinner for a small group gathering at my home. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a one-to-one -one equation so my lawn mowing is equal to your spaghetti making uh, there's no real hierarchy established uh, but it's a real interesting way of getting people to volunteer and again build those connections um, one of my favorite uh, 
activities that have sprung out of a lot of this is what we call courageous conversations. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of uh, some of the problems that other communities have had around policing, particularly with uh, minority groups. And we did not want to see anything like that happen in our community. And so we have been working very hard to bring people from diverse backgrounds together over a meal to have an intentional dialogue about issues that matter to people. Um, and it's been amazing some of the initiatives and activities that have sprung out of those conversations. <coughs> this is going back to the um, data mapping. Um, just showing you that we can drill down uh, at the community level, we can pull out to the county level, we can get a real good idea of where uh, some of these traumatizing events are occurring within our communities. And, and some of the, the data mapping has been used specifically for the trauma-informed community development initiative, which is that neighbor, uh, neighborhood-based approach of addressing the those adverse community uh, environments. And so with our data mapping, we were able to uh, identify uh, several neighborhoods in Meadville, which is where we're starting this project, uh, and go out and meet with those and, and use that to at least inform uh, areas that we thought had a need, a specific need, as well as potential for uh, neighborhood uh, leadership and activism to be developed. Audrey's already spoken about this. This is just a pictorial showing you the four areas that we're focusing on. I don't think we need to say yeah. No. no. There's various resources that, that we've identified. Uh, one of the, of course, uh, resources through SAMHSA have been invaluable for our process, uh, but there are Others that I don't think we've listed here that are in addition to um, a particular use would be ACEs Too High. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but that is a, an excellent website for uh, a vast uh, amount of information on ACEs and its impact and then ACEs connection as, a, as an opportunity to connect with people. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, the, uh, the, the Roadmap to Resilience is uh, something you can get out on SAMHSA's website. Is that correct, Joe? Uh, or Audrey? SAMHSA. Audrey, where'd that come from? It came from, well, it's on ACES Connection, and yes. it's a, okay. a resource, and it's also on the Community Resilience Cookbook. There you go. So it's a little hard to see and, and read on the uh, slideshow, but I would encourage you to go out and look at it. It really is. If you're looking for a roadmap, that's about as good as one we've seen. In our, I think our last slide is the uh, kind of the the base resource centers. Uh, there's certainly many others, and we we get into all of them. Uh, we're happy to take whatever anybody is offering and and try to apply it locally. One of the things we wanted to talk about briefly before maybe opening up for some questions, uh, you know, we've certainly had lots of opportunities. Uh, we've uh, identified ways that, that work pretty well for the development of our organization. Uh, that is having some type of community infrastructure doing this on a countywide basis has been a challenge just because of the, the nature of our demographics. Um, but it's also had its advantages in that we can work in relatively small areas where we have lots of connections just by virtue of our size. Um, some of the things that have been very helpful for us is access uh, through the VISTA program as a, um, as a resource to work with organizations that have VISTA workers and also potentially um, we're looking at uh, maybe down the road, depending on our source of funding, uh, okay, uh, applying for a VISTA for our uh, trauma initiatives. Our volunteers are essential to uh, making the public awareness piece work. Uh, you can't you know, obviously have paid presenters uh, for every type of presentation you want to make. Uh, 
even if they're giving away a lot of their time, uh, people have to, to make a living. Um, some of the challenges have been the fact that you know, we're a rural community and uh, you know, fairly conservative. Um, talking about trauma and uh, adversity doesn't necessarily resonate with our local farmers or any, you know, any of our community members. It's, um, you know, what, what doesn't break you makes you stronger uh, type of um, uh, approach. So uh, being able to explain the, the impact of trauma on brain development and early childhood development and things like that, uh, that takes some doing. So that's, uh, you know, we often have to work through that kind of knee jerk response that this is just another fuzzy topic. Um, what are some of our other barriers, uh, Bruce? So, you know, everyone's slapping that label now on everything trauma informed. Um, so I think if you're going to get down this road, it behooves you as a community to define what that means so that, um, when somebody says they're trauma informed, it means a certain set of standards or um, conditions that are easily recognizable by everyone. Otherwise, everyone's going to slap that label on it and it, it just will stop and cease to mean anything important. Audrey, what, uh, what do you think are some other challenges? Well, one of the things I, I guess it goes along with what both of you were saying, but the whole idea of, you know, really right now, um, I think there's a there's kind of a um, phenomena in which people are confusing trauma informed with um, not wanting people to take responsibility for their own behavior, and so kind of the idea that um, we're we're just wanting everybody to you know sing kumbaya and put our arms around each other and um, and not be responsible for behavior, and so. Um, I think we fight that a lot. Um, just that that's not what we're advocating and to really be clear about that um, because it really turns, it, we found that it just turns a lot of people off. Um, and once we, once we can have a dialogue about it and really get it um, more, more clearly defined, we're okay usually, but, but we, that's a constant, that's a constant battle. Any other and, Question. Um, I think that pretty much covers our our presentation. Uh, we're happy to take any questions and answer them as best we can. Uh, so, uh, Joe, Audrey, and and Sabrina, and uh, Bruce. Michael, Bruce. Thank you. I was going to say Dan. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for um, that that presentation. And I think so just I just want to give a real brief kind of synopsis uh, of kind of our, our overview of what I'm hearing is a lot of it took time. There was the really the investment of the multi system agencies and beyond the agencies that multi system so when I say system hey, how are that's you? also the youth and family members. Um God, stop being here. Why are you working? Oh uh, uh, it's uh, it's not everyone's on mute, so we do hear some outside conversation. Um, <laughs> and also looking at the multi-funding of things and partnering with other counties, I think has really been key to how the Fed has been able to help develop this over time. I, I do have one question here, um, and it is, do you have a specific tool you use uh, for an organization self assessment um, that led to the, their goal setting. Um, Joe, if, if you don't have one, I know that we have some um, examples of that that we can always share with the group as well. Um, with some informational um, setting. Well, I think our, for the organizational piece, Audrey, it was the uh, Harris Pallet. Yes. Yep, we use Harris Pallet. And um, some people use the homelessness. Um, self-assessment, which is the other, another pretty popular and available assessment. And uh, we can put each of those uh, tools up on the website right underneath this webinar, which we will also have the uh, slides um, and a recording of this session as well. Um, and that's on our website, www.pacarepartnership.org under training.
We've also recently discovered um, Trauma-Informed Oregon, mm. uh, and there's a lot of wonderful uh, tools out on that website, so we would encourage you to check that out. And, of course, SAMHSA has uh, a lot of great tools as well. Mm -hmm. But there really is no one way to do this. I think every community will be different. Um, what we've learned through the Peace Four movement is that each of these Peace Four communities are approaching it a little differently, emphasizing different aspects of the trauma-informed movement and implementing it in ways that are unique to their community. And there's nothing wrong with that. My suggestion would be just get started, pull together as many people as you can that are interested and can be trauma champions and just start having dialogue and it will take off. And, and, and I commend you all because you were able to really engage all of the different partners to show and have them understand the value of this and what it was in for them, not just the value of what it was in for a system of care or one agency to really kind of show that cross-system value. So I think that's really key to some of your, your great success on this. All right. Well, we have a couple of thank yous and a couple of well done on your project. Um, Thank you. Let's see here. Let's see, um, how do you assure when conducting the ACEs questionnaires that participants are not re-traumatized? Are there focuses on protective factors? I think uh, that's probably a question I'd ask Audrey to answer. I would just comment a little further. We are doing a lot of surveying on ACEs. Um, Human Services now offer offers the ACE survey to clients through its mental health intakes. Uh, we're doing it in our child welfare units, and it's also been incorporated into our student assistance uh, programs for some of the school districts. Um, so it is a, uh, important that we approach that uh, properly. And we, I know for an agency basis, uh, the people who administer the the survey do that. Um, they do an introduction to what it's about. Uh, they emphasize that uh, it's not a, um, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion that because you have a high A score that you're going to be uh, dead 20 years later. Um, and, and emphasize the resiliency, not only emphasize the resiliency factors and how it affects different people different ways, but also um, we make sure we have resources available uh, and simply pay attention uh, when talking about the subject as to whether there's a need for further intervention. I think, Audrey, you probably have more uh, specific, I think, reaction to that type of concern. I, I just think it is a, it's really crucial that the people who are going to give it are well-trained, that they really have have good training to do all those things that Joe just mentioned. Um, you know, particularly um, also talking about resiliency. I really like that um, when agencies employ the ACEs uh, questionnaire, they also employ a, a resiliency questionnaire so that people are, are being, um, so that both aspects are being looked at. And also that the people who are giving the assessments also have good supervision so that when they're running into problems or things, they can have someone who's really um, going to help them and, and give them good supervision around that. So I think training and supervision of the people giving it is really essential. I think you're on mute, Mark. Thank you. I said we're about one minute out. Uh, so um, if there's any more questions, we can get them in. If not, uh, you are all welcome to sign off. And uh, I just thank you very much for your, your, your participation today. And uh, if you do go to our website, www.pacarepartnership.org, we do have a webinar tomorrow on um, cultural linguistic competency, um, which is going to be on, let me just pull it up here real quick. And if you go to the training section, it's the first tab under there um, on the drop down. It's cultural responsive systems of care to engage families first. Um, that'll be at two o'clock tomorrow. There's a registration on that web page, and then uh, also the information to have a log on. All right. All right. Thanks, well, thank everybody. you all very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.